So um, we're really happy to have Brian Barnett with us today. I'm happy because I didn't have to prepare an introduction because I know him so well. Um, <laughs> Professional <laughs> introduction. For, right, but even so, I uh, feel like I have a grasp on it. So Brian is uh, the last of our Carla presentations. He's the last of our new hires to present. He just started in French and Italian in August. He is the Director of Language Instruction in French and Lecturer in French, and his research interests span a range of topics related to language varieties, particularly in North America, um, and French, of course. So today, the topic of his talk is not so I'll turn around, is Showcasing the Power of Transformative Learning, a look at students' perspectives on French-speaking North America. So please welcome Brian Barnett. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'm sure that when you saw this topic in January or February when it became online, you were highly anticipating this talk, so we'll get started. So the first part, transformative learning, which I'll get into a little bit more in the definition of it, but I wanted to share a little bit of m probably the key transformative learning that moment that I went through was when I was in graduate school and I discovered that there are these French speaking communities within my own country. So with, I'm from the United States and that was my disorienting dilemma and that made me then change something in terms of my own perspective and my career path. So that was my probably a very key transformative learning moment that I went through. And so we're gonna be talking about um, students, undergraduate students, as they went through and discovered these communities as well. This time me being the instructor. And I want to mention before we start that this is still a very you know, work in progress. I haven't gone through and read through all the data um, carefully and so this is an initial analysis so if there's something that's a little unclear or you might have something that you like think well you kind of missed this feel free to add so to begin uh, this is a map of from 2008 where French is spoken in North America so a lot of these places are you know could be expats but then you have these communities you know New England uh, Louisiana where you have these local groups of French speakers. And I started integrating French in the Americas in units, not in courses. And, uh, and so the initial reaction that I got, this is a quote from a, when I taught at the University of Oregon when I was integrating this into, uh, like, let's say a two week unit into a particular level. Um, this is, I think, a student's disorienting dilemma right now, is it's great to see the French within our own backyard, that there is French here, it's still alive, it's still kicking, it's, it's still struggling a bit, but it's still there. And so this type of experience after I had students talk to me about what they thought after this two-week class, or two-week unit, I thought, well, I need to develop an entire class around French in the Americas because I already can see what two weeks of exploring these content, this content has done. So before I get into the data of the students that took this class, I wanna share a little bit about the course itself. Okay. So it was a semester long course on French in the US. It was a third year French course. So these are students that are interested in French. Okay. Many of them are majoring or minoring in French. So there's this motivation. And so some of the goals, I wanted to make sure that students realized that these cultures were alive. Okay? It's not just a legacy. I wanted to expose them to a variety of different resources. So documentaries, literature, discussions on Skype. Okay? Give them a, a general vision of the historical side, that's important. To understand present day problems and also the problems of the past that of these groups of French speakers are going through and have gone through. Okay. Other goals um, to recognize um, people that are very active in the community of French in the United States, to get them used to hearing and reading different varieties of French in the United States, and to identify and produce several characteristics of North American French. So these are third year, so they already have a solid base of the language. So those were 
some of the major course goals. Key assignments that all reference during this presentation, so they had these reflective journals. They did four of them throughout the course of the semester. And they also did this um, session-long project, which the, the product that they were wor working towards was a work of art. Now, work of art could be a watercolor, it could be a comic strip, it could be a song. It, could, it was very open. So it was up to the uh, particular student to pick a genre that they liked, and then they had to integrate cultural linguistic aspects of the course in this particular art project. Okay. And some examples of the final product, the work of art, here's a poem that a student wrote. So why are, uh, why are we proud? We're here stuck in the middle. We speak Cajun, we speak Creole, but we promise our allegiance to the United States. We teach international French. Why are we proud? We dance to the music of Zachary Richard. We play the violin, the accordion. We sing with courage, with passion. We don't have, and they use the international French terms of raccoon, cars, dollars, shrimp, and alligators, and then they incorporated the Louisiana French words. Why are we proud? Okay. So they had to produce this and then analyze and where did they integrate the particular um, aspects of the course content. Okay. Another student decided to do a children's book where they integrated um, aspects of Louisiana French. So, comment les haricots? Okay. That's how to say, like, how are you? Instead of comment ça va, they would say, comment les, ar les haricots? Okay. Um, and so they integrated, je reste à Lafayette, instead of j'habite à Lafayette, I live. Um, the difference of uh, the verb to know, they, in, in, in uh, Louisiana French, they often use the verb connaître. Okay. So these are some examples of what students produced at the end of the course. Other activities that they had, um, I had a Facebook group where I've had um, many um, uh, French speakers from Louisiana, Guadeloupe, uh, Nova Scotia, Saint Pierre et Miquelon, are belong to this Facebook group. Okay? And I've changed it to Franco Amérique University of Minnesota. So if you're interested in joining, you could. Um, and so we had uh, to get them interacting with these communities, these people that speak French within the, the Americas. So I asked them questions, like we watched the, to my people in the group, not my students, who joined this site. The students watched a movie and responded to the question, how is Fra Franco-American culture represented in the film? And then we kind of did coding of the data and then here were some of their major themes that came out. So with pride, the importance to keep traditions, a sense of community. So this is what we did in class. And then the, the, I had people interact. Like, so someone asked, that's not in the course, what is a community? Can we say that the, there, uh, a French speaking community exists in the United States? Even today, how do you know it? And then I would go back to my students and we would answer and have this dialogue um, through Facebook. Uh, another way that we used Facebook was we had people come and, well not come, but we used Skype to have interactions with, for example, Amanda Lafleur is a Louisiana French speaker. So Amanda came in and we, had, uh, we read an article that she had uh, published and then my students asked questions and then at the end we had some additional questions that they weren't able to ask that I typed up and they were able to um, ask and then Amanda answered. So one of the questions, why is it important to develop a program for uh, illiterate adults like a ABC 2000 in French? So many of the Louisiana fr French speakers did not grow up being able to read French okay? because they, it was a, they were punished for speaking French. So how does this program assist the f Louisiana French speakers? And so then Amanda wrote back, uh, literacy serves to give value to the vernacular to the, 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 the larger audience, it's proof that no, our language or our speech is a real language. Okay? So very meaningful, once again, it's not just the course content that students were experiencing. They were interacting with members of the community, either through Facebook or several of these students also went on the ISU, on the two bayous spring break trip to Louisiana. So they were able to spend a week in 
Louisiana, where 85 to 90% of this trip was in French, okay? interacting with people. And so this is another experience that they were able to, to, to use when I asked them to reflect on their assumptions, beliefs of the French-speaking communities of the United States. Okay? Uh, uh, just a small portion of what they did. Um, so the first night, we had supper with members of the community and they played the, the card game Bourré. Um, so they learned how to play a, a specific card game. There were tables of, let's say, two of my students and three members of the community. And they you know, chatted in French and learned how to play the card game. Um, another day, we had a cooking demo of couche-couche, which is kind of a cornmeal mush, traditional, um, where you put like figs or cane syrup in. So they learned how to make that. Um, they learned how to do the traditional method of egg dyeing and packing, which is, um, or pocking, which where you have an egg and an egg, I have an egg, someone else has an egg, and we touch ends, and whoever makes the egg break loses, and the person whose egg did not break wins and moves to the next round. So that's a tradition that they do in Louisiana. Right. So that gives you kind of a very brief, quick overview of what these third year French students went through in the course of the semester. And then my research project, the qualitative research project, was looking at um, my participants were the students in the course. And what I was looking at was exploring the possibility of students' transformative learning through the use of structured reflections. Okay, so we talked about early earlier that they did four journal entries. Um, those were the structured reflections. So a little bit about transformative learning that started the, comes out of the um, adult learning theory. So if you attended the, the talk by Stacy Johnson back in February, she talked a little bit about one of this as a model. And so it started um, by Mesereau back in the 90s, and you can see a few definitions throughout the years. And so I'm just going to read um, the three. So transformative learning is the process of affecting change in a frame of reference. Okay. Transformative learning is first and foremost about educating from a particular worldview, a particular educational philosophy. Okay. Transformative learning describes the learning process that takes place when adults reevaluate previously held beliefs and attitudes and begin to interpret experiences in a new way. So it's much more than acquiring basic skills, facts. Transformative learning is much more. For the frames of reference, so these are the structures of assumptions through which we understand our experiences. So this is something we have, you know, we have a frame of reference. And so my assumption for the frame of reference that these undergraduate students enrolled in my class, who are interested in French because they're in the third year level, is I thought they would have limited or no knowledge of Francophone communities within the United States. Okay. This is based from my own personal experience of going through a undergraduate curriculum and also what I've seen at various institutions. Okay. Um, French speakers in the U.S. do not exist except those who studied French as a world language or those visiting from the outside. So that's what I thought I was working with in terms of what their frame of reference was towards these communities within the United States. And then frames of reference are transformed through some type of critical reflection. My critical reflection that I used w was the structured reflection journal entries. Because, um, and then these critical reflections on the assumptions upon which our interpretations, so remember the beliefs, habits of mind, or points of view are based. So frames of reference is an important term in, uh, in transformative learning. Another term that uh, is often mentioned is meaning perspective. So this is the way to view the world through the lens, and this is getting at one's assumptions, um, experiences, cultural norms, and linguistic norms. 
Um, something that I'm still debating that personally is kind of the difference between frames of reference and meaning perspectives. So I'm still um, wrapping my mind around that. It could be maybe frames of reference to me are a little bit more like the, like the umbrella term and then maybe uh, meaning perspectives might be underneath that category, but I'm still reflecting on that difference. So maybe to help you out, I thought coffee might be a good example how to understand. So we have some type of new information, right? Um, so French in the Americas. And then we have this, it goes through this filter of this meaning perspective. Now, might not be the perfect metaphor because a potential transformation of perspective can take place. Normally when you make coffee, it's going to guarantee in some type of coffee product. But for a potential transformation of perspective to take place, there needs to be some type of conflict that will take place to make you reassess. And it doesn't ensure that a transformation is going to take place. But I thought it was a kind of, make, gives you a visual of kind of, of, of the process. So common characteristics of this type of learning. So first of all, um, there is some type of disorienting dilemma. Right? And that's what I mentioned at the first with my own example, where I discovered this group of French speakers that being an MA student, I knew nothing about. And I was very passionate about France, um, French speaking cultures, but I knew nothing about them. So that was kind of that aha moment that made me really think, um, hmm. And then some type of critical assessment. Critical assessment meaning that I have to reflect in some way. Okay. And in the case of my students, it would be the structured reflections that they did. Okay. And this is where it gets a little harder, a course of action, because this, this critical assessment that makes you, gives you conflict and makes you reflect on how your point of view or your habits of mind are currently um, put together. If it is truly transformative learning, you're going to then want to take a course of action to change and integrate into your own new perspective. And that's why it's kind of hard to determine this after one class. Huh? And how to accomplish this in the classroom. Outside of the classroom, you know, it was like, it was very easy. I saw it happen with the exper experiential learning. When I took my group of students to Louisiana, I could really see the interaction that they were having, that it would lead to more potential transformative moments. So for example, we visited a French immersion school in Louisiana, and one of the students who was an education major, she's really interested in becoming a French immersion teacher. So that potentially could be a transformative learning moment for her. And, that, and a lot of that I think took place, not just because of the course, but because of the experience in Louisiana. But in the classroom, the idea to do that is you can do, you know, some type of arts projects, which I think the, type, the example that I gave at the beginning could lead to some type of transformative learning because they really had to reflect on their piece of art. Um, the structured reflections is the path that I used for this study. And so structured reflections have been defined as intentionally designed exercises, activities, or assignments that help students and others make connections between assumptions held and experiences encountered, assumptions held and theories, concepts known, and experiences encountered and theories, concepts known. So this is the, the task that students um, completed. So the data, and you have the handout, which um, I hope, did everyone receive one or if not, um, uh, yes, looks like everyone, uh, I, I see one hand up, Karen. The... Oh, okay, thanks. Um, so what you have, you have all four journal structured reflection topics. Okay? And these were edited from two colleagues that shared, um, Corey and Mike were developing structured reflections on German. 
as a whole. And so mine were edited to focus on French in the United States. So you have the four topics and these journals. So the first one, I was very nice, wasn't I? Because they had to turn in their first journal day one of class, okay? So they, <laughs> reason being is I wanted to get their initial assumptions, right? I didn't want to have any previous course content. So this is what they brought to class on day one. And then you can see journal two was due week five, journal three, week 11, journal four was week 17. Then another data collection point uh, was a one-on-one -on -one interview with me once the course grades had been submitted. So I had seven students who agreed to continue on and complete the interviews with me. You have the last part of the, the page three and page four of your handout is the complete interview protocol that I used for that interview. So you have access to both the journals and the interview protocols. So the first journal question, and we're not going to, as you probably assume that this was a lot of data and it probably would take several hours to present all four journal entries and the interviews. So I'm focusing on uh, just a few. So the first question for journal one, so do you consider the United States part of the French speaking world? In the United States, how useful is the French language? Okay, so remember my population are majors and minors. Okay, so these are not students that are taking the requirement, the language requirement to potentially stop at the end of fourth semester. Okay, so I was curious to see. So I had 10, so five said yes, five said no. Okay. Which is, I find, you know, still quite low, especially because these are majors and minors. Um, and here's some of the, the, the major themes that came out. So those yes, presence of French in the United States and useful in classroom and outside in a professional environment. I had four students that kind of shared um, this comment. Even though that there's a small amount of French speakers among Americans, that small amount contributes to numbers in the French speakers around the world. So four people had this pr similar perspective. Okay. Um, other people thought it was useful okay, in terms of work. So being in you know, going to school in a, you know, fairly rural part of Indiana, you know, I, uh, two people thought that it was useful in work-related situations. Uh, for example, someone mentioned a fast food restaurant in a travel center. So two individuals of this yes shared this type of perspective. Um, no, so why only with non-US citizens or in academic context, so, um, the idea that it's only useful for people from French speaking countries, that was for three people that kind of shared this perspective. Another two said, you know, it's only in the classroom settings by teachers and professors, not useful for outside of the classroom. Okay. Well, is it surprising though? Um, to me, it's not too surprising. Um, so that was first part of journal one. Uh, journal four was very fascinating to me because this was the final journal entry at the end of the semester. So we had talked about primarily two cultural groups. We talked um, heavily about the, the Franco-Louisianan population um, and we also talked about the Franco-American who are uh, in New England. Okay, so those were the two groups that we had focused on. And for this final reflection, students had to choose either the, the group from Louisiana, the group from New England, and develop a cultural iceberg. Okay, and you can see some models on the handout of a cultural iceberg. So what's, we had talked about this, like the top of the iceberg are things that are more obvious okay, to individuals. And then below the surface level are more of the, um, parts of a culture that are a little bit more harder to describe. Okay. So students had to develop their own and then write in a reflection about and talking to me about their particular iceberg. So here's one student's iceberg. Um, so the student picked the Louisiana group and so she put, um, you know, the, their name the Cajuns, and then she mentioned some key terms like bayou the, in the country, 
bad French, something that um, came out in the discussion, and the stereotype of this bad French. Right. And then down below, um, you know, the community, the promotion of the language, um, and then the deep part was the faith, the use of the language and family. And so they had to kind of unpack why they, you know, why they had this stuff up here, down here, and this is after their experience of the course content, and if they went to the trip to Louisiana. Okay. So that's one student. Uh, another student picked, uh, and this one's very hard to read, um, the New England, okay? And so what she put on the top, so they have these little groups that were called L Little Canadas. This is where the groups of French speakers um, would live, close to the factories, the textile factories. They're called Little Canadas. Um, oh, the same color of skin, white, okay? This was uh, someone from uh, non-white origin, uh, religion, traditions, and then down below she talked about assimilation, survivance is the idea in New England where the this French is going to survive if it's connected with the Catholic Church. Okay. Survivance, um, being ashamed, loss of identity, pain, okay? And so that was the kind of, that summarized. They had to really reflect on the culture that they selected and then um, put it together in some type of iceberg and then write about that reflection. For, for the interview, I thought would be most interesting is talk about the topic domain number two, which was transformative learning. And here you have the questions that were linked in that particular topic domain. So a topic domain meaning like this was transformative learning. Other topic domains I had were the course itself, French in the United States, a yes or no in terms of should it be in the curriculum? Um, so those were topic domains. It's kind of like the global theme of a particular section of the interview. So assumptions, this is at the end of the semester. Okay? These students went through this interview. What were your assumptions about French speaking communities before? Uh, what are you taking away from this course? Okay. Um, I think then has your understanding of the course material on the French communities in the United States made you change your view of how you see French in the world? Has this course knowledge changed how you see yourself as a French speaker? Okay. So these were two questions where I wanted them to think, okay, you in the larger French speaking world, knowing about these communities, does that change how you see that francophonie? Okay. And then because of this content, do you feel it's changed you? Do you see yourself being different as a French speaker? Right. And this is what I'll be focusing on in uh, presenting some of uh, the answers of what students said. So one of the global um, topics that was interesting that came out of this, very relevant to the workshop on, on Saturday, is introduction to the concept of language varieties. So a student, all I, all I was ever used to was the standard French from France. That's all I've learned. I think that languages helped me look at French in a better way and want to explore more about their French. So this, you know, this disorienting dilemma is this idea that there are these other types of French and this came out often. Right? Um, you don't really think about the fact that there's several different languages that have kind of, you know, slammed together. Yeah. <laughs> Said it probably the best way. Um, it's a lot more diverse, it meaning French, than I thought it was originally. Right? Okay, there is French, and then there's these other versions of it that other people speak. Uh, this linguistic variation and understanding that because of linguistic variation, there's this linguistic inferiority complex that can be um, present by students, but also speakers, okay, both ways. Um, so a student said, so I knew that there was also different varieties because it's spoken in different countries, but I didn't realize there's variety here within the United States, okay? People don't look at it the same way as they look at speakers from Belgium, okay? Like, I feel they don't recognize it as an actual language. 
So this was interesting that the student, um, this particular student was um, of African origin, so not from the United States, and came in thinking, you know, so Belgium French, another European variety, there's not such negative views towards that variety. But for a variety of US, I'm, it's not illustrated in this quote, I remember from the student, she didn't realize that they even existed here. And then once she did, she really battled with, well, this isn't really, I mean, good French, she mentioned a few times. Um, for the different perspective on French, right? so um, students that it shows kind of um, social level, it means you had a good education, a higher education, people that speak, and this is from someone that's native languages in English, um, that speak actually French were ashamed of it. So, and the course knowledge, um, how has it changed you? I really loved this class, it was amazing. I think it really improved who I am and how my French was going. Uh, another, I see myself as a better person for taking this French class because I had the opportunity to learn not just about one culture, but two of them. And now they had different varieties of French. And all I ever learned was about one type of French, and that was the standard French from France. And having this class really opened my eyes to realizing that where you come from can have a huge influence on what your language is going to be like. Okay. I think it made me a little bit more confident knowing there's not just one right way to speak a language. So I feel like they're moving, you know, we're talking about transformative learning, like a different perspective. They're moving in that direction. Okay. This student, it was interesting as well, I didn't include, um, the, stated that she was of African descent and it was inter she said it was interesting to her. It was probably the first time she ever saw people of uh, Caucasian origin being oppressed and that stood out to her. Um, meaning that these were saying that they were uh, like speaking bad French, like people have these negative judgments. She said she had never witnessed that before and it stood out to her. Um, and so people, has it changed yourself as a French speaker? So remember this was, a um, few people said yes. Um, this student, um, not really. I pretty much, I still see myself as a language learner, okay? And that didn't change much. I don't know, maybe you asked us if we identified personally as a, as, as a francophone. I don't think I may have said yes. So at the beginning of the course, I asked them if they, do you believe yourself to be a francophone? Um, and so this one said, I think I might have said yes, but I think it's not true in any regard now. I speak, I can speak French a little, I can understand it, but I'm not, I feel like, I feel like the word francophone has a lot more to do with they speak French every single day of their lives, at least in some regard. Going to Louisiana, it just kind of made me realize that maybe I'm not as good, not as good as communicating in French as I otherwise thought. So that's changed. So these are some uh, like initial things that have stood out to me. In terms of transformative knowledge, I say potential transformative knowledge occurring, especially at worldviews is what I've noticed so far. Right? A lot of them had a different way of um, moving towards um, a different view of the world. Lesser extent of themselves, ourselves, meaning the student's place in it so far. And as I mentioned, it's kind of hard to determine exactly if it's 100% transformative knowledge because I haven't seen if they've taken this new perspective and applied it in their lives in a new way. Um, one thing I, that's come out is I'm definitely making visible and validating marginalized varieties. That's something that was very obvious to me. Um, very positive reaction okay, from students to integration of Francophone North America. A student told me um, in the interviews gives a broader spectrum on what it means to be a Francophone person. And my next steps are continue with the journals and interviews and gather additional data from spring 2018 course here at the U, which I'm scheduled to teach this course here with University of Minnesota students at the 3000 level. Okay. Um, so that's all I have for today. And just to end, if the topic interests you, 
Um, Kate mentioned the, the workshop, if you're interested in this topic, about uh, language uh, varieties and registers. Here's some of the information. So um, that's what I have. Thank you. Okay. And any questions or comments? Okay, yes. Um, for this course, um, no, no. Um, I would like to add a, a New England component. The issue is spring break to Maine is not an ideal destination. <laughs> okay. Um, and the other challenge logistically with Maine is the communities currently today, where it's not a historical legacy, are quite isolated. They're up on the northern part of Maine. So if you, let's say, you fly into Portland, Maine you still have to drive like five and a half hours to get to these communities. So it's, it's a little bit more challenging um, in terms of, of including Maine. Um, how did you, you just started that trip by yourself? Like, did you research like, where to go? How did you do it? So I was very lucky that um, my dissertation work, I lived in Louisiana for a year working um, with immersion teachers in the immersion schools. And I was one that I was very active and just interacting with a lot of the Louisiana French community. So I had a lot of uh, connections. And then there's an organization, which I failed to mention, which was New News, um, who is the, one of their uh, missions, is a cultural mission. It's also environmental, they do a lot of things, but the cultural mission is the promotion of Louisiana French. So they did a, they helped me set up the, um, some of the activities. And just so you know, I, th since you were the first one to ask a question, you get the extra Louisiana cooking magazine that I received in the mail today. So, <laughs> you should have asked a question. Yes. <laughs> That, yes. So we have two populations there, the snowbirds from Quebec uh, and the Haitian diaspora is what I'm guessing. I'm assuming. That I do not know. It's from D the Louder and Waddle's book on Franco-Amérique yeah. and the, they don't explain. Does it? Says Does it? Okay, so okay 2000. Okay. From what I assume, that's what I've always been interested, like the expats, is that's who I thought of the Florida, the Florida data. And so my second question is, do you have more recent census data? Because that's fairly old, it's from 2000, yeah. right? And so I'm wondering if you have access to the 2010 census data, only because I know that some of these communities are dying out. They're going down, you're right. So I do not know, and it's a good question that I should look into because I liked it because it was just such a great map, yeah, easy to use. Um, and so I, I should look at more of the, the recent census, so it's a good point. And two things I wanted to mm -hmm. say that I was so happy that you do the artwork with the, of Hodao, because mm -hmm. I often do that at all levels. Like, we'll go see an impressionist that's exhibit at the MIA, and then the students do an artwork based on that. Mm -hmm. I think it's really great in our language courses when we can give them another outlet. Oh, like yeah. It isn't just the writing and the speaking, but they do this artwork and then they do these amazing things. Yeah. And I reproduced some of them in the Minnesota ATF newsletter because they were so beautiful. So I think that, that the poetry mm -hmm. and the artwork is so important. And then that student who did that poem like totally got what you were doing with the Zaka VP shop. Well, they got, I mean, so that's what they're, they had, well, it wasn't just that they had to produce the artwork. Yeah. And that's why I think the artwork is accompanied with some type of reflection. Because right. they had to tell me, where did you specifically integrate content from this course? Yeah, that's why I think yeah. it's really good because you want to you make the artwork a really meaningful yes. thing that's connected to the course. Yeah. That's really good. And then I wanted to get back to this thing you said about bad French. You know, it isn't just the students in your courses who think that, but when you adults think that too. They think that if it's a variation, then it's bad because a lot of the grammar and the music, you know, it's just not correct. So what? how do you get over that? Do you, do you just compare it and say, oh, well, this is what they actually say, 
And it isn't bad French, it's just a variation. So, you, you right. so these students, because they're in the third year, I mean, they were advanced, fairly right. advanced. Right. They already, so it's, when possibly would you be using Louisiana French? So like when we went to the trip, on the trip, we, we talked a little bit thinking, well, if you wanna create a connection right. with your community, so for example, you're going to speak with Louisiana French speakers, you might want to say, Aster instead of maintenant. So, so we're, I'm not doing any type of one's better than the other. It's right. kind of like what moments is it appropriate to change varieties? So it's actually very similar to when we tell our students, you know, we're reading this novel that's full of vulgar language and that little Keith Keith Demet in 104, and I have to constantly say to them, don't say this when you're like si sitting with a French table and having, you know, at a French table and having Sunday dinner. Yeah. You don't want to say these words. So we talk about registers, you right. know, like traditional French, but this is like really your, your, what do you tell them about if you say this word, the people in Louisiana might just laugh at you because you're trying to learn it? If they would use the local, right. I think, I mean, because I saw it live, like yeah, with the, it went. it went well, because actually it was interesting. There were two different universities, mm -hmm. uh, my university and another university, they were there at the same time. And, I, and what I hold, told, was told from my students is they felt that all the work that we did on the linguistic side of Louisiana French mm -hmm. prepared them better to interact with the Louisiana mm -hmm. French speakers. So they could because, recognize those words. Yes. And, and then they were able to understand and then possibly, they might not be able to produce them all, all the time, the production side, but at least the receptive side was stronger. So when I took students to Quebec in my um, job years ago, we had the same issue because we were in Quebec for a couple of weeks mm -hmm. and we actually had talked about words that were accepted in Quebec that French people didn't use that yeah. much. And it was the same thing, it was the reception. Right, and that's why it's important, I think, to, and that's why kind of the, you know, on Saturday's workshop, is we're getting into that discussion on, it's important, I think, at all levels to start getting students to think about linguistic variation. You might not ask them to produce, like I asked mm -hmm. my students to do here, but at least the recognition. Mm -hmm. Okay, I saw, but I saw uh, Gabriella's hand a while ago, so. In class, yeah. yeah, they start. Yeah, some of them did. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, and I don't know if they were aware of it or it's just like. Well, I don't know. I don't know if they intentionally like doing, let's say, just a discussion activity once we came back. I don't. I never did ask, but I did notice that a few times that because of their experience of that week long immersion trip, that they did start to use some of the structures. But I don't know if they're going to maintain them or not. Since I've left, I don't know. I'm. I'm not seeing them in a French class anymore, so I don't know if... That, that reminds me, when we were doing all that Verlon stuff in 104, the students started to text each other. Yeah, like Verlon. And, and then you realize that they've actually been listening and reading, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so that's like something good. Yes. Yeah. Well, and this kind of tags in with all that. I wonder if you notice anything even anecdotally that kind of points to a difference between acquisition versus learning and where mm -hmm. maybe a, a term of uh, Louisiana French was picked up in a real intense acquisition moment and kind of anchored into the vocabulary much more solidly than something that was merely learned through vocabulary. It could, I mean, the initially it was a learned, so we had activities like where they had to use the dictionary of Louisiana French. So it was initially, I think, learned variation, mm -hmm. but then that week long trip when I wasn't always around, like sometimes they, like I was driving the van, <laughs> that's quite a, of six undergraduate girls. So it was an interesting experience for me. <laughs> so I dropped them, you know, at some points off and they would go, cause I didn't want to always be the, like come to me. Like I wanted them to be, have to, and, and so it was interesting. There, there were, I think a lot of acquisition moments um, that took place, but I have to say it was an initial I, it was learned. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Did they pick up any terms that you're like, oh, I didn't think we'd be learning that? Interesting. You learned that. Okay. Uh, that they said to me later? Or? Did you just notice, like, either in their conversations with themselves or in class when you returned back to Indiana, there was like, huh. Nothing comes to mind right now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes. 
Um, I'm wondering if any of the, because I saw the journals were in English. Yeah. Um, if any of these responses that you received connected to world Englishes, so maybe learning about how there is variation in French um, in different parts of the world, if they mm -hmm. connected that, oh, there's differences as well in English. There's perhaps a North American standard, but there are also other varieties that are not sub. Yes. So, yes. So, the, they, no one from like in their answers, from what I remember, made the connection to world Englishes. And I didn't myself. It probably would have been a nice connection to make, to make them take this idea of French and apply it to something else. Um, but I did not guide it that way. Do they? I forget. And the African one? Yeah, the African student. Right, right. But she's not a L1 of English. She's from, let's say, Tunisia. If, if, maybe if it's that one. So is she L1 Arabic and French? Yeah. Because this was a content based course. It was, so anyone was eligible. Um, yeah, I think I know which is the. Uh, back two slides okay so yes so this one yes so this is someone from Zimbabwe so, she spoke Shona yeah yeah so it was a very interesting course because I had two, uh, a Mora uh, someone Moroccan Zimbabwe and then Indiana so it was an interesting mix so this one is, in, so I was thinking in my mind with that question for someone from Indiana, like someone, oh, yeah. yeah. And so we, they didn't make the connection. She did, but her. But this is not someone from uh, Indiana. Right, right. So for her making that connection, somehow I was, I, like I said, I was having it for my mind, my participants from let's say Gary, Indiana. This one is, she already is coming in with a different perspective because she's from Africa going to school in the United States. No. Okay. Any other questions? Just a follow-up on the information on the map. MLA has the updated uh, information. Perfect. From the okay. Seven. Okay. So I will look that up. Do they have a nice image as well, or just st stats? Uh, I need the stats? Stats. Okay. 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 Well, thank you very much.